Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Marcia Stedman. I'm president of the Board of Directors of Healthcare for All Washington. And on behalf of the board, I'd like to warmly welcome you to Healthcare for All Washington's 2020 virtual annual membership meeting and program. Whew. What a year 2020 has been. Just as the 2020 legislative session was ending in March, we were preparing to celebrate our legislative wins, but the coronavirus pandemic forced all of us to change our daily routines. Healthcare for All Washington immediately realized that we needed to change our focus on and reach people digitally. In order to do so more effectively, we began several ambitious projects to address our communications infrastructure. I'm especially proud to report to you today that our vigorous and vibrant communications team, now led by D.W. Clark, who previously worked for Como TV, has rebuilt our website, published deep policy-oriented quarterly newsletters, a monthly bulletin, frequent action alerts, and an expanded social media presence. We published three op-ed opinion pieces and our press releases ensured our name and work was reported on in newspapers and TV news around the state. We also produced this beautiful and comprehensive booklet, which we are using in fundraising and outreach. We participated in the Give Big campaign last May. On every metric, Give Big was a tremendously successful campaign for us, and we had a 360% increase in the number of donors from 2019. And in the most important show of our success, we raised 1,110% more in funds than last year. That allowed us to keep staff throughout the summer to support our prog progress. It was a good boost, and it showed us how the investment of your dollars in healthcare for all results in real progress. That progress is reflected in our strategic communications. We turned out hundreds of supporters of publicly funded universal healthcare who made public comments about their experiences in health, with healthcare to the universal healthcare work group at their virtual Zoom meetings. And for those who could not attend online, we, uh, they submitted written comments to the Washington State Healthcare Authority. 2020 has been a year of tremendous growth for the Healthcare for All Washington, and your support has made that growth possible. As we know, the coronavirus pandemic quickly became an economic crisis and also exposed the problems of an employer-based healthcare system, as well as the inequities of healthcare access. Five months ago, more than 1.1 million Washingtonians were receiving unemployment benefits yet hundreds of thousands more were not even working. More than 850,000 people were without health insurance during a pandemic. Now is the right time to make our decades long struggle for health equity a reality. We must continue working together with our allies in labor, other advocacy and community organizations, such as healthcare as a human right, the healthcare professions, and our healthcare champions and friends of healthcare in the legislature in order to achieve our shared goal of truly universal healthcare. Speaking of champions and friends in the legislature, I think we have a few of those with us today. Uh, we have Senator Patty Kuderer of the 48th Legislative District, Representative Marcus Vicelli of the 3rd Legislative District in Spokane, former Representative Denny Delmo and current member of the Universal Healthcare Work Group is joining us from Spokane as well. Representative Tina Orwall of the 33rd District from the Kent, SeaTac and Des Moines area and Representative Jerry Pollitt from the 46th CD, the LD, sorry. We thank our champions and friends and loyal members, supporters and volunteers for your tireless efforts to bring publicly funded universal healthcare to our state, especially now in order to open up our economy again, but even more so after we have a vaccine against the coronavirus and need to make sure pre-existing conditions are covered. Universal healthcare is a requirement for getting everybody the healthcare they need 
when they need it, regardless of their employment status or economic circumstances. And speaking of economic circumstances, our annual meetings are traditionally the time when Healthcare for All Washington replenishes our funds for the coming year. Please help us to continue our effective work in Olympia by supporting the work of our part-time lobbyist and support staff in the coming legislative session. The donations link, look for it in the chat window, will be live throughout our program for you to access our secure payment site at any time. All contributions are gratefully appreciated and will be acknowledged. Thank you in advance for supporting our work. And now without further ado, please welcome Healthcare for All Washington member, Erica Nialius Grau, who will introduce our featured speaker. Erica. Ben Danielson is the Senior Medical Director of Seattle's Odessa Brown Children's Clinic, which just celebrated Odessa Brown's 100th birthday and the clinic's 50th birthday. He is a clinical professor of pediatrics uh, at the University of Washington. For decades, Dr. Danielson has been passionately advocating for equity for the most vulnerable in our populations. Uh, in 2008, he helped found the Washington Medical Legal Partnership, which helps people from underserved communities understand and secure their legal rights regarding health, safe housing, adequate schooling, medical needs, and more. Dr. Danielson co-chaired Washington's Office for Equity Task Force, which was intended to promote access to equitable opportunities and resources that reduce disparities. And he has served on the boards of many local health and community organizations. In September, Dr. Danielson was one of the community leaders participating in 12 Arguments for Change, the series of live virtual panels that envisioned an equitable post-pandemic King County that was convened by Executive Dow Constantine. He has been featured in the Seattle Times, King 5 News, The Atlantic, Crosscut, GeekWire, and many other news sources. I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Ben Danielson as Healthcare for All Washington's featured speaker. Well, thank you very much for that kind introduction. I'm very honored to be uh, part of this gathering today, and I really look forward to listening a lot more than I speak. Um, but I did have, uh, just appreciate this chance to share a couple of thoughts around equity. Um, I kind of want them to be thought provoking and um, encouraging of conversation rather than um, pulling through complete um, arguments or cases for issues. I wanna share just so that things I think about when we continue in this struggle for equity, this struggle that is uh, transcendent of this moment, but so strongly informed by these times. I was gonna just share a couple of points and then I wanted to uh, invite a conversation, a discussion, some questions, sort of see where that takes us. Um, I'm really looking forward to this and I, I just really appreciate all of you for all the work that you've been doing for a long time and will continue to work in this endeavor. I'm stealing your screen now. And um, wanted to just start this conversation with a couple of uh, slides or information that I think about. So my thoughts about equity uh, really started from where I get inspired and where I think we need continuing inspiration. And for me as a pediatrician, it often comes from the smallest packages in our society. I think about the courage that people show throughout history to see and do things that are unpopular, um, unappreciated perhaps at first, but that are changed, that are ways that change the way our nation thinks about things. I think about Ruby Bridges, I honestly do, in this time today because I wonder about the individual acts that maybe we are inspired to do, to continue to work for change. I think about Ruby Bridges because uh, I think about this image and the determination in the face of this very small person uh, by herself crossing a threshold willing to do something uh, that takes incredible courage and determination and dedication, even when uh, the environment surrounding her is discouraging of these efforts. Think about the uh, school dress and that um, satchel full of notes and that determined way she crosses into spaces that are unwelcoming. And that discomfort, that unwelcoming, that uh, courage is really something that I think those of us who have more years under our belts really need to continue to see as points of inspiration. 
I also think about her role in naming and guiding a future um, and how predicated it is on the intersectionality in our society today. When we talk about anti-racism and equity and advancing the rights of everyone and addressing issues of socioeconomic deprivation in the way that our country um, foists it upon us, uh, I wonder about how to be most effective in promoting health. And so for me, uh, I'm really guided by this message that was given by a former Surgeon General many, many years ago. It's almost something written to, into our DNA in our clinic, which was really to the point that you can't educate an unhealthy child and you can't keep uh, an unhealthy child educated. The idea of education and health are so intertwined, especially when you focus on young people, but I think uh, more broadly, the it's the thread that that holds and pulls us through uh, some of the most difficult challenges in our days. I wonder how you think about the intersectionality and the work that you do, the spaces and places where one cannot exist without the other, the dyadic and maybe the multiplicity of ideas like education and health have to be rights that are shared across broad swaths that are relevant to each individual and that are ways and paths to lift up uh, incredibly bright futures. I think about these things around equity and how they don't stand by themselves, how what informs our well being and our health is so powerfully connected to so many other factors. I've looked in, in my career, my training, at all of the technical skills that I've had to study and learn in medical school and residency. I've thought about the many ways in which. Um, skill and technical ability and access to technology and innovation are so incredibly important, how we lift them up in this country, especially around healthcare. And then I think about the lessons that I learned as a pediatrician in a community. And I would have to say that a nurse practitioner named Liz Thomas maybe didn't say these exact things, but she taught me this lesson that when it comes to health and well-being, that it is really the intersection of these three factors that are more important perhaps than any others that inform education, inform opportunities for housing, inform the ways in which our, our culture, our infrastructure is built and the challenges of economic alienation. Um, I would have said poverty, but I think in other countries, poverty actually isn't so harmful to your health in some ways. Toxic stresses, the, the things that we learn about as adverse childhood experiences or the things that you know today around the day-to-day -day trauma and stress of existing in a time of coronavirus. And I think about racism and oppression. And it's important to, for me to make this point in this moment that although those things all overlap, they are completely separable. They are also completely distinguished from each other so that we don't get to say that if we solve for economic alienation, that we automatically then solve for things like oppression and racism. And just to make that point really clear, um, I look at what happens in some of the most critical and important times in the process of, of developing and giving life in this world today and in this country today, especially. And I make the point that if you are a black woman, if you are the most highly educated black woman, the, the wife of a former president or the greatest uh, woman tennis player in our history, um, despite that economic uh, access and all of the privilege that comes with that, your chance of dying and the chance of your child's dying in the first year of life after delivery are higher for you as a black woman than they are for any other woman of any other race who has not finished high school. And my point is economics and racism are separable. The same for stress. You can be rich or poor and face great amounts of stress. You can be rich or poor and face racism. You can uh, be of uh, any BIPOC or white race and face economic deprivation. These factors interact, but the deepest wound and the deepest um, issue in this country really is it's 400 plus years of racism and how that informs the many other kinds of oppression that we face today. And I wanna make this point about racism that I read in uh, Tanahisi's Coates book uh, many years ago, which is that race is the child of racism, not the father. And what I, I hear from that phrase is that uh, we created the construct of racism first. We built on the foundation of racism first. And then the ideas of race, which have no biologic principles built into them, were constructed in order to um, 
further the ideas of racism. This has been important to me to rethink the way I talk about things. For instance, I used to talk about differences in health outcomes based on race or disparities and disproportionality based on someone's race. And that's actually a false statement that feeds into a false narrative. The truth is that we have differences in health outcomes based on racism. And we have um, disproportionality across many spectrums of our life based on racism, not on race. These ideas have to be the kinds of things we think about as we talk about and consider the issues of uh, equity in our conversations moving forward. These times are hard and they have this um, impact of, of a healthcare crisis, a health crisis, and also the impact of reckoning around an issue of um, uh, violence against people based on the color of their skin. And I have to make this point that if I'm a good pediatrician, then I'm supposed to be giving advice about the things that are most ri risky, uh, that pose the greatest health risk to the families I serve. And in a clinic like ours, uh, then I have to recognize that for the young black and brown um, adolescents and young adults who come through the door and come to our clinic, um, their seventh leading cause of death is being shot by police. That me myself as a black man have a one in 1000 lifetime chance of dying uh, by the gun of a police person. If I'm not incorporating the conversations about racism into the work that I do, even at the basic level of what is the anticipatory guidance that everyone needs to know about, then I'm not doing my job as a pediatrician. These factors are so important. Our conversations have to be so intense and so intentional. And I think that we cannot let ourselves off the hook at this point. I'm really worried about us losing focus on the issues of racism and equity in our lands. And I just wanna warn you that the most important sign probably that we are losing focus on issues of equity is when we start to create jingles and commercials and create an advertising momentum behind them rather than a movement, a social movement of protest and policy change and activism. So when you start hearing a jingle from Coca-Cola about equity, you must be very worried that our energy and our focus has been lost. And I just wanna say that the focus and energy needs to be there. It is so important that we are all part of that energy, that we can do things that are beautifully disruptive, that we can have an energy that is so beautifully disruptive that it knocks people off of their balance, that it creates a different dialogue, a different conversation, that we can show up in a way that is so powerful, so elegant, so uh, irrefutable, so beautifully disruptive that we can be part of that change just like Ruby was so many generations ago. These are important topics and issues and they don't just end at conversations or policies because what I observe as a black person who's had to navigate and survive many systems of privilege and profession and uh, uh, white dominance is that I've had to learn how to do that without showing my full self, without being the angry loud black man, without being the person for whom someone finds harder to accept in their circles. And we need a future of diversity and presence in our, at our tables, at our places of leadership that really allows a black person, a brown person, and an indigenous person, a person of color to show up with their full, full selves, not with their code shifted selves or their tempered selves or their attenuated selves. When we start to see that, that uncomfortable disruption from voices that are not familiar to us, then we will start to see real change. These are thoughts that I want to provoke and have you think about. I still think a lot about Ruby and the path that she took and the bravery that it took, but also that she was doing that alone and she was doing that in an adverse environment where the people who saw her wanted to jeer her. And what I see today um, is this different kind of promise. This is a school very close to where I live and where our clinic is. And what black young people see today when they start the school year, at least back in those times when we could laugh and hug and cheer and high five and say hello to each other without the muffles of masks is a welcoming of people who look like them saying, I see you and I celebrate you and you are part of this space just as you are part of every other space that your belonging is unquestioned and is celebrated. And so I love the reference back to Ruby Bridges and her courage, but I also love the reference looking forward to a space where uh, belonging is assumed, not asserted, that it is felt, not demanded, that it is part of everyone's life, not something that requires policy or guards or protections to enable. 
those are some of the initial thoughts I just wanted to share with you. And I'm sorry for rushing through them, but I'm really more interested in what are the thoughts of equity that you have, what these ideas provoke for you. And I'm hoping we can have a, uh, a, uh, a bit of a conversation based on how these images and ideas have been stri striking you as an audience. Thank you again for letting me just open up with a bunch of ideas, throw them out there, and then listen for the conversation that comes afterwards. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Ben Danielson, thank you for sharing those thoughts. Uh, my name's D.W. Clark, and um, I would guess I will start the Q&A. Do you feel optimistic uh, as we go through this moment in time that we're all experiencing? Um, I feel optimistic by some signs and some people in some corners. I feel very worried um, that we are a short attention span society, that we'll move on to another issue, lose focus on equity. I feel very worried that we went through a time in the 60s when there was great upheaval, where in one summer, 21 plus cities were on fire and that the movement of civil rights was um, in an intense phase. And yet, after all of that struggle, we're still back to where we are now, a time when Martin Luther King Jr. himself would be really sad and, and upset to see the divisions, the isolation, the uh, withdrawal of rights, and the ways in which communities are oppressed so much. I will say one more thing, if I could. Um, I also see that for something that I think is actually on the whole much smaller an issue than racism, and by that I mean the coronavirus, I see that our society was willing to make some incredibly deep sacrifices for an issue that is smaller uh, uh, in intensity than racism. We were able to wreck our economy in the name of addressing this coronavirus. And if we're willing to make that kind of sacrifice for something that is smaller in scale to the issue of racism, I guess it makes me wonder, maybe we really are ready to make incredible sacrifices for the incredible progress of addressing the issues of equity and racism in our society at last. What do you see as the first priorities for seeking healthcare for all to begin bringing about equity in healthcare? I um, would love to hear other people's thoughts on this. I kind of wonder, there's a constant ethical dilemma that I live in where I feel at times like the efforts of incrementalism have been the enemy of great change and progress. So I wonder every day if I've been, if I'm on the health exchange board and I'm helping to create um, what I think is a good experience for people to enroll in health coverage, but it is delaying us talking about universal health care. Uh, I worry about my complicity in that. Uh, even as I believe that good work is happening in different spaces and places, um, I know that I'm a bit more of a revolutionary than I am an evolutionary person. And um, I wonder if we have forestalled progress by shining a light on increments. Uh, I'm curious, um, have you seen any um, segregation in medical uh, care for people of color? Yeah, the evidence comes up over and over again in our nation. There's a study that's done maybe every decade um, that looks at a million uh, emergency room experiences for children. These are all children who have come in and have been a, diagnosed with appendicitis. And what the evidence has shown in ERs across the country, the ER that you go to, the ER that the people you trust and respect work in, uh, the good meaning people who don't think that they have bias, is that you are 80% less likely to get adequate pain med medication for appendicitis and irrefutable pain if you are black. The color of your skin drives the amount of care that you get, regardless in so many ways of people's good intentions to try to do good work. And that tells me also that the work of undoing racism and bias is not as easy as a stroke of a pen or an agreement among us to say, let's just not uh, do bad anymore. Let's just be good. Um, there is healing and reparation and undoing that is so deeply built into our systems that it will take harder work than just good intentions. I'm getting some great questions from our audience. Here's another one. My grandmother's hands has given me an appreciation for the degree to which black bodies have been and continue to be treated differently in this white body supremacy system. Black people viscerally feel this lack of care and caring in their bodies when they encounter the system. 
How do you see rooting out this deep systemic bias in our current healthcare system? I actually think that there are some roadmaps for that on some levels. Um, I do think that uh, reparation and healing is an important first step along this path. And I mean acknowledgement of the historic pains that are a shared acknowledgement across our society. I mean a, a true reckoning for the, the amount of wealth that has been built on the backs of, uh, of especially uh, BIPOC and black, black communities, especially the land that has been taken from indigenous people in order to work that, um, that wealth into uh, the kinds of things that we're so proud of as a country. I think about the creating of, uh, of enhanced opportunities for communities that have been so long left behind. And then I think about the ways in which that healing and reparation then can lead to some unlearning and deconstruction of the places where racism exists deep, deep, deep in our structures and how we can create the tools. And I think there are tools out there that help you visualize and understand when those are showing up. Ultimately, I think we also then in a third wave, uh, simultaneously, but as a third phase really need to change leadership from um, white male cis hetero dominated voices to a much broader table. And it can't be just one person uh, who is BIPOC or LGBTQ or represents um, an oppressed community at a table of other people who are oppressors. We really need to diversify tables with enough numbers that critical voice can actually rise up, that opinions can be shared freely without feeling afraid and where people can show up as their true selves, as I mentioned in my brief presentation. Uh, we have time for one question, one more question. What indicators should we measure to see progressing in addressing racism? Okay, so I have this dream indicator and I would love to join with anybody who wants to come with me on this journey. I think our measure should be our measure of belonging. I wonder what it would take to find that measure, what the scope and scale and quality of that is, but I would love to uh, spend some time working on creating a measurement of belonging. And I think that if we measured and held ourselves to this sense of belonging, which is kind of why I was showing the Ruby um, uh, school entry and the school entry at the end, um, then we would really know that we are doing the right kind of work and it would ground us in continuing to move forward. Thank you, Dr. Ben Danielson for everything you did for us today and for the work you do. Uh, I've had the uh, good fortune to meet some of the doctors over there and I'm inspired every time I do. Thank I you very Thank much. You. Uh, now back to Marsha. Thank you, Dr. Danielson. I always love hearing what you have to say about racism because it's so um, enlightening, new things every time. <clears throat> now I'd like to introduce Cindy Laws, our lobbyist. She joined Healthcare for All Washington in 2019, three days before the, the hearing of our priority legislation that year and immediately went to work helping to strengthen the pathway to universal health care bill. It um, ultimately passed as a budget proviso and we are now um, uh, seeing the fruit of that work in the universal health care work group that is nearing up its year and a half long um, schedule of work. This year, she helped us strengthen and pass several important um, bills that we had um, incubated and um, those that were covering cap, uh, capping insulin copays and setting up a work group to study total insulin costs. Cindy is a longtime policy wonk and previously served as executive director of Healthcare 2000, Healthcare for Washington's, uh, of, uh, Washington's predecessor organization. Before that, she served as a staffer in the US Senate and Congress. Please welcome Cindy Laws. Hi everyone. Thank you very much for coming to this uh, annual meeting. It's so great to be able to talk to you all about the tremendous progress that we've made in the past two years. I'm gonna go fast. So hold, your, hold on to your horses here. Uh, we passed, as Marcia mentioned, we passed as quite a package of bills. In the past two years, we've passed eight bills. And this year we have specific goal with four insulin drug affordability bills that we worked on in advance with Senator Karen Kaiser and with Representative Eileen Cody. 
Um, the bills included Senate Bill 6087, which caps insulin copays at $100 uh, for a 30 day supply. At the end, we did push an amendment to try to lower that to $30, and that may be something that will continue moving forward in the future. House Bill 2662 established, in addition to the copay cap, it established a total cost of insulin work group. And that work group is really key because the goal here is to have bulk purchasing, the state using bulk purchasing to buy insulin. That program came out of what we lobbied during that bill was we pointed out that the childhood vaccination program that we have in the state of Washington uh, provided the great model to which we could do bulk purchasing. That's how, how, that's how our vaccines are, uh, for children are purchased. So it's been a very successful program for many, many years. And Senator Kaiser ran with that when we talked about that. Another bill that we supported was 1608, House Bill 1608. And this prevents religion-based providers from lim per limiting information on patient options. And this is really important because as we've seen the consolidation of major um, medical facilities like Chai Fran Franciscan taking over much, uh, many, many hospitals, this prevents those entities from preventing patient information on things that those entities may not approve of, like death with dignity, abortion, or other options. This bill that was so important to pass prevents them from limiting access to that information. This actually kind of ties to earlier federal legislation back in the early 90s, which were gag orders, preventing doctors from talking even about abortion. So this is a similar kind of bill to that. Another bill that was a wonderful surprise that was promoted by two Republicans was House Bill 2464. We quickly jumped on this bill and met with the sponsors of the bill um, to enthusiastically support it. And it limits the maximum amount a purchaser of prescription medication can be required to pay at the point of sale. And that is really important because there's so many different prices being jacked around for consumers. And this really helps limit that maximum amount and keep, makes things more consistent. Another one we pushed was House Bill 2457, which establishes the Healthcare Cost Transparency Board that will annually calculate the total healthcare expenditures in Washington and establish a healthcare cost growth. This actually is one of the most important bills that didn't get a lot of attention, but it really is critical because one of the things we know is that the huge variance in cost transparency one person in Seattle may pay $1,400 for an MRI and in another part of the state, it may only be $400. So having this be more transparent can really help actually get to a point we can control the costs and prices of healthcare. It's gonna be very difficult to cover everything until we can better control the prices that are charged. And finally, our other bill that we passed this year was Senate Bill 6088 and it established a drug affordability board. Sadly, even though it passed both houses and the floor and everything else, it was one of dozens of bills vetoed by Governor Inslee when it became apparent that the pandemic was causing a budget shortfall. And about that budget shortfall, it's now $4.4 billion. It's much better. That's actually good news because back in June, it was forecast to be $8.9 billion. So with the federal stimulus money that came into people's pockets and the huge uh, extra $600 a week people were getting on unemployment for those several months, they turned right around and spent the money. And then since our tax system is based on sales tax, uh, people spending the money helped level out the budget crisis. So it wasn't nearly as bad as it had been projected earlier. We're hoping something similar will happen with the next stimulus. But right now we face going into January with a $4.4 billion budget shortfall. And that does, uh, will put a cramp on some of the things going forward with Representative Rich Shelley will address. I wanna talk about how you will recall earlier this summer, prior to the primary, we had asked all of the candidates running for the legislature to ask, answer a question on whether or not they would support and pledge to support a bill on publicly funded universal health care. We took the records of those people that did, and, and to be very clear, we have a majority of the Democrats in both the House and the Senate did sign that pledge. That's wonderful to know going in uh, to the legislative session. But particularly, we awarded health care champions 
to these representatives and senators who not only had signed the pledge, but have consistently sponsored our bills and voiced support for universal health care that's publicly funded. And they include Senator Derek Stanford, Representative Marcus Riccelli, Senator Bob Hasegawa, and these are in order of their districts, by the way, Senator Sam Hunt, Senator Christine Rolfes, Representative Steve Tharinger, Senator Jeannie Darneal, Speaker of the House, Lori Jenkins, Representative Jake Fay, Senator June Robinson, Senator Lisa Wellman, Representative Tana Sen, Representative Nicole Macri, Representative Frank Chop, who's the former Speaker of the House, Representative Javier Valdez, Representative Jerry Paulette, and Representative Deborah Intiman. I also want to call attention to many, many Republicans. You know, last year when I spoke at the annual meeting, someone asked me about our enemies and how we deal with the enemies. And I responded that I don't view any legislator, maybe one, but I don't view legislators as enemies. I don't view people that other people would view as enemies because it doesn't help us pass legislation. Last session, many, many Republicans supported our legislation. On House Bill 2662, which was the bill sponsored by Representative Maycumber, Representative Maycumber is one of the most conservative members of the state legislature, a Republican from Northeast Washington. But her infant during the legislative session went to the hospital with an, uh, it turned out that he was type one diabetic. And that experience that she had in trying to find and get care for her infant really showed what happens when we bring these stories directly to legislators. Healthcare affects them and there actually is a diabetic caucus in Olympia. And so she was one of those that helped uh, advance this very important bill. And Senator, so Representative May Cumber made progress. But special friends included Senator Ron, Ron Muzzall of the 10th district who did win his Senate seat. He was with us on almost and every bill but one. one. One vote, he didn't vote with us, but every other bill, multiple votes, he was with us. Representative Joe Schmick was with us almost every bill, as were Representative Michelle Calder and Kelly Chambers and Representative Paul Harris. The four of those Republicans all sit on the health care committee in the House. I also want to call out Mike Steele, um, who is up in the Chelan County area for being with us on most of these votes. We're going to continue to expand our relationship with all members of the legislature. And we'll look forward to some new folks. The House and particularly this Senate Health Care Committee are going to have a lot of new faces. So it's going to be a lot of relationship building forthcoming. And that's why we need to make sure we can expand our capacity going forth. Coming forward in the 2021 20, legislative session, we're gonna be pushing bills that did not pass last year, but were really solid bills that we were pushing. They include a primary care collaborative. It includes a bill pushed by the insurance commissioner to have a fee on nonprofit health insurers with excess revenues. And this, for example, Regents and Primera are nonprofit insure, health insurers, but they have billions of dollars in reserves just in the state of Washington. The fees on these excess revenues would help cover people who don't qualify for health insurance subsidies currently, but they can't afford the lowest cost health plans on the exchange. So it fills this donut hole. Representative Riccelli's bill will help provide premium assistance to those people. And most importantly, we're looking to advance the expected outcome of the Universal Healthcare Work Group. As you remember, the Universal Healthcare Work Group was created as an outcome of the 2019 Pathway to Universal Healthcare Bill, which passed as a budget proviso. The work group includes 33 members. Six of those members are from Healthcare for All Washington. We did a phenomenal job of packing the work group. At least three quarters of the work group are in favor of Model A, which is one of three models that the uh, facilitators have put forth for study. Model A is the publicly funded universal healthcare program. Most importantly, the actuarial study that came out of the work group shows that in the first year, the cost savings of insuring everyone in Washington is $2.476 billion less than is what is being spent now. Covering everyone costs less. We've known that for a long time, but we've got studies that show it. The savings actually increased to $5.7 billion per year in future years. So this is going to be our big push. 
again, we're gonna need extra money to help make this across the finish line. And currently we've been meeting with our, our federal delegation and it was really important to pass on some messaging that we got from Adam, uh, Congressman Adam Smith. Congressman Adam Smith is one of the most important people. He's chair of the Armed Services Committee. An enormous amount of healthcare legislation goes through the Armed Services Committee. He actually does handle not only all the active military, but also the veterans. So after passing another stimulus, that's the most important thing that they're going to be doing right away is the stimulus. But after that, the next most important thing that Congress is aligned on doing is strengthening the Affordable Care Act. The next thing that they're going to focus on is passing HR, HR 5010, 5010, which is the state-based Universal Care Act. This is a top priority for us. It has necessary waivers for ERISA and other waivers that will empower states to pass their own health care bills. This is what we need to pass the pathway to work, the pathway work group stuff. These waivers are were identified as the work group as crucial. The drug affordability bills that are in Congress, such as HR3, are also likely to move forward. There's broad consensus on those bills. There's broad consensus on some other areas as well. Finally, SCOTUS, the Supreme Court and the Affordable Care Act. By now, most of you have probably all heard that the Supreme Court hearing was a lot more favorable than anybody expected. It's not a crystal ball. We don't know for sure how they're gonna rule and they won't issue a ruling until probably some uh, spring, maybe late winter, but most likely uh, early spring. But the questions that came out of Brett Kavanaugh of all people, really indicated that they weren't inclined to overturn the bill. They commented as Justice Roberts, Chief Justice Roberts noted, there was a lot of comments and questions about the fact that had Congress wanted to overturn certain things, they could have done so in Congress and they did not do that. So that's really bears well for us in, in making this thing go forward. But strengthening the ACA, the biggest part of that uh, to go back to the federal legislation is areas where there's broad consensus on no matter whose party and that consensus includes making sure that pre-existing conditions are covered and so things are looking good for us we have a lot of work to do it doesn't slow down for a nanosecond the champagne bubbles had far barely lifted away uh, from when we're starting to chill the next bottle of champagne for the future victories that we're going to have. So I'm glad that you're all with us. I'm really grateful for all of the support. I want to mention again, Marcia talked about the um, op-eds that we published. The importance of those op-eds was that the timing of them, we strategically timed these op-eds uh, so that, and we urged in the op-eds for people to comment on the public, on the work group. And they did. 140 public comments were made after the August meeting. And the majority of those came right after the publication of our op-eds in the Everett Herald and the Spokesman Review. We also got it covered in the Nisqually paper. So it works. Those are your efforts, your calls to legislators, your emails. Again, we have to keep moving forward. Every step that we make forth in healthcare is a prominent step moving forward. And just to remind everybody, this isn't new. Univer public funding of, of health care is not new. Maybe universal isn't new. It's over 100 years old that it was proposed by, by uh, candidate Teddy Roosevelt. But President John Adams was the first person who passed public funding for a health care element. It keeps happening. It keeps moving forward. Don't be discouraged. We won the presidency. We hold strong in the state house and the state legislature and we still have a majority in the states and the US Congress. We can make this happen. Dig deep, push forward and fund deeply. So with that, I'm gonna introduce now, uh, I'm gonna introduce Kevin Wren and I'm going to introduce Patty Kuderer. If we have Patty on, we're now a little bit ahead of time. So I'm not sure. Kevin, uh, if, if, or, or Ronnie, rather, you've seen Patty jump on. Um, Senator Patty Cooterer is a, represent, a senator from Kirkland, Redmond, and Bellevue. She has told an extraordinarily extraordinary tale 
when she was testifying on the floor of the Senate in favor of the pathway bill. And Senator Cooter doesn't sit on the health care committee. But her story had everybody in the Senate gallery wiping away tears. And I'm not going to get into the details of the story. I'm going to let her tell her story. But it was truly powerful. The other person I want to introduce is Kevin Wren. Kevin was one of these people that when you testify in bills, when you have folks there, you get to work with the people that you may not know. You hear their stories and you're moved by the stories. And as long as I've been working in this stuff, which goes back to the 80s, I still get touched by people's stories. It shows the power of the individual stories. Kevin is a type one diabetic and he told his story about trying to purchase insulin. And as young people, the amount of young people that are dying from not being able to afford their insulin, his story was compelling. So I reached out to Kevin and over the next several months, we worked together on passing these bills. We're so impressed with Kevin and his passion and his articulate nature and the other organizations that he worked with that we asked him to join some of our committees and to work with us. And then we were so impressed with him, we asked him to join our, our board of directors. And I'm very pleased to have Kevin Wren working with us. So Kevin, take it away. Uh, thank you, Cindy. And um, I'd advise, um, I'd ask that anybody submit questions to the Q&A so we can ask Cindy some questions. Um, please fill them in and I'll, and I'll ask Cindy. Bring it on. <laughs> Bring on the questions. One of the questions I know that people ask all the time is, um, is about, does this incremental thing work? And I want to address that a little bit just outright, because while a lot of people want to have the big bang, they want the big bang, they want the big thing. But again, that's what part of the reason why I emphasized that Teddy Roosevelt was campaigned on universal health care. Uh, that was a long time ago, 100 years ago. We've had bills covering to, to have universal health care coverage introduced in the U.S. Senate and in Congress every year since the 1940. It took for speaking of incrementalism, Social Security took many, many years to go. And while it passed initially, it wasn't very broad. It wasn't until 1964 that the bill was substantially expanded and it continues to be expanded. So these are some examples of how incrementalism happens all the time and it continues to move things forward. So we'll look forward to some more. So I see a question on uh, more on the bill to increase premium assistance coverage. Um, this one actually, Gary, thank you for that question. And I'd like you to ask that question when we get to Representative Riccelli, because that is one of his bills and we're strongly supporting that bill and want him to reintroduce that bill uh, in, the in the upcoming session. So we can hold off on that one. Anyone else has any more questions coming up? Any more questions? So we wanna hear about the healthcare transparency bill. Um, we wanna talk about the, this was a bill that, I, the healthcare transparency bill was a really important bill. It had um, a lot of support and yet it, the, what happens of course, I'm not sure everybody understands how many bills get introduced every year. There are roughly 5,000 bills that get introduced each year. And the caucus leaders in both the Republican caucus and the Democratic caucus and the House and the Senate, there's four caucuses, they will kind of determine which bills are the most important to pass. So the bill that we're talking about here was the health care transparency bill, which was 2036. It died on the floor of the House, meaning that it had passed the health care committee. It passed the health care committee nine to six, the House health care committee. Then it passed the Appropriations Committee 19 to 12. It passed the floor of the House 56 to 42. There was, um, and then when it went to the Senate, it passed the Health Care Committee by seven to three. And it, so it appeared that this bill was gonna be going gunbusters, but they just ran out of time. And this is the challenge every year when there's a short session. Those of you who may not uh, always follow this as closely as, as crazy people do. Um, but the session last year was, was a 60-day session. 
which means you're already under the gun and trying to pass a bill to go all the way through both chambers in 60 days is really tough. The bill had strong support. It wasn't super, super bipartisan, but it did have strong support. So hopefully we can get this bill going again. Um, there's a little bit bigger majorities this time and hopefully it can find a place in the priority list. There's a lot of priorities are taken up this time, but hopefully we can get this one, this one done. As far as the next question um, about each legislator limited just two or three bills, uh, I don't think that that is really enforceable, um, that every year they try to make sure legislators are managing their own expectations um, on how much that they can get accomplished. I think that there's, people may introduce more bills, but whether those bills actually get heard is going to be tougher. The biggest challenge I see in the coming session isn't the number of bills that are gonna get introduced, it's how things are gonna get lobbied at all when the public doesn't have genuine access to the legislator, legislature. The legislature's hearings and everything are gonna be held virtually. And when you have that limitation where you can't just pass somebody in the hallway, you can't send them a note, they can more easily stall you and push you away, that is really gonna make things more difficult. And I think that the leadership uh, of the caucuses on all sides are trying to minimize the, the number of things flying back and forth so that we can get things passed more successfully that are higher priorities. Um, but it, you know, you've got 147 legislators and trying to make sure every legislator sticks by those goals to two or three. But honestly, that's the first time I've actually heard that. So uh, you know, how much it's actually gonna happen, I, I seriously doubt it because everybody's real excited about making progress now that we have the presidency back and that we can pick up where we left off uh, many years ago. It was very clear that President Biden, President-elect Biden, isn't that say great to say, President-elect Biden wants to have a public option in uh, the Affordable Care Act. And so after they strengthen these other provisions, that will be the next big thing that they'll be pushing is to build in a public option. Meanwhile, it was also really clear that they're going to be the president-elect Biden will be working and had set up a, a group to work with, and especially with Senator Bernie Sanders, who to advance how they're going to transition to the next steps. Congressman M. Smith cautioned us very clearly that it's really important that these areas of price controls will be really critical. And he made it really, really clear that there is, while there's a strong consensus in Congress to strengthen the Affordable Care Act, that we have to make sure that the price controls are gonna be a big part of whatever happens. Because otherwise, if there are no price controls, as he put it, the Medicare for all would be bankrupt in a year without price controls. And again, we can talk at length about, you all know stories from your own family and friends about how huge variances are when it comes to um, the price of care. Senator Cooter, thank you again so very, very much for being with us today. Um, we're all real eager to hear. Well, thank you, Cindy. And it's really a pleasure to be here with everyone. Um, what Cindy's referring to is the story of the birth of my daughter and how I became a convert to universal healthcare. Um, about 28 years ago, uh, my daughter was still born at six months gestation. Uh, she was revived. She weighed one pound, 13 ounces, and she spent uh, five months in the hospital in the NICU. Uh, and during that time, she had three surgeries, uh, one on her heart, one on uh, her eye, and the other to insert a feeding tube um, to save her life. And a lot of the care that she had during, um, all of the care she had during her stay at the NICU was life-saving. And, uh, and there were times during her stay there that the insurance company was claiming some of her care was quote unquote experimental. Uh, I am a lawyer and I fought them and they backed down and I got the, and she got the care that she needed. But I have to believe there were other families in the same situation that we were in that, that didn't have access to legal uh, advice and maybe didn't fight back. Uh, and, you know, that angered me at the time, but I was more concerned about the daily vigil at my daughter's um, incubator. And when I brought her home at five months, uh, she weighed, you know, a little 
three and a half pounds roughly. And there was a letter waiting for me when I got there telling me that my daughter, my daughter who was five months old, had nearly reached her lifetime cap. Now, you know, I've got mother bear instincts to start, but I can assure you that that letter sent me through the roof. And it was at that moment that I realized how bankrupt our healthcare system was and that it really was only for those who had the resources. And as luck would have it, I met a doctor, a pediatric nephrologist during her hospital stay, who also happened to be an author. And one of the things that he wrote on extensively was our broken healthcare system and how it didn't cover everyone in the country. Um, and I read a lot of what he wrote and that did absolutely influence me in terms of um, you know, my view on healthcare in our country. And from that point on, I have been a convert to universal healthcare and it has to be publicly funded. I think the pandemic has shown us that it's foolish to attach healthcare to employment. And so we need to have a system where it's publicly funded and portable for everybody. And I've actually been uh, you know, exploring the possibility of having an interstate healthcare compact with Oregon and California and a federated board that would act as a single payer uh, to, uh, to pay the bills. And, there would, and it would be paid by leveraging Medicaid, uh, a payroll tax and a health tax for starters um, on, employer, on employers. So the time has come for us to reevaluate our system. You know, there is no other country in the world that has copied what we have. Uh, I described it on the Senate floor as a Frankenstein model where we have different programs for different demographics. And even with all of the demographics that we have, including private healthcare, we still have millions of uninsured people in our country today. We also have thousands of people who die every year from curable diseases. That's not a system that's working. And it's time that we, we move in the direction of universal health, it's long past time, uh, and join the rest of uh, the countries that have seen that this is really one of the best investments we can make in, in our greatest asset in this country, which is the people, our human resources. It's a smart thing to do. And now is the time to do it. So I want to thank you all for, um, for listening to my story. Um, I will give you some good news. Uh, she is, um, she's doing well uh, and she's living on her own, not taking any of my money. So I feel pretty good about that. She is a double major graduate from the University of Denver as well. So we lucked out. I mean, she's got some residual, but we lucked out overall. And, but I know that there are other um, babies and people out there who aren't as lucky and didn't have the access to the healthcare resources that we had. So with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Cindy, and thank you for letting me share my story and my passion for getting universal health care established in our country. Senator Kudra, thank you so very much. I really appreciate it. I really hope and would love to have you on the Senate Health Care Committee. I know there's going to be a lot of movement around there, um, but I'm looking forward to having you testify once again um, in support of this bill's love. We've actually talked more about the, um, the tri-state thing. And that's something we've mentioned in the work group, uh, Universal Health Care Work Group. So thanks again. Really appreciate you being here. And uh, it's going to be a great session. Yes, it is. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. So now we're going to hand us over to Kevin Wren and to Pat Cashman. And I am pleased uh, and elated to welcome the hilarious Pat Cashman from Almost Live fame to help lead our paddle call today. Kevin. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to work with you and a pleasure for me to be here as a part of the, today's big event for HCFA. You know, the best advice I ever got in my employment, and I'll never forget the words of the general manager who told me, Pat, clean out your desk. You're done here. And that was bad enough, but it was also bad that I then lost health care for a period of time. Kevin, as you said that about rationing, is that is that something you actually did where you had to say, I don't know what level yeah. of insulin you uh, take? It's happened like, numerous times in my life just because, I mean, insurance is tied to employment and graduating into the recession in 2008, I was underemployed, underinsured and was rationing insulin. Um, my father, fortunately, is a diabetic, so I was able to glean from his stash, but 
It happened again in 2013 when I was laid off from my job at Microsoft and couldn't afford my COBRA payments. Um, fortunately, the ACA came through and I was able to afford my medicine and didn't have to ration. But even, I mean, six months ago, when I went to the pharmacy and my doctor switched the prescription, so all of a sudden insurance wouldn't cover and it was more than my rent. More affordable health coverage for Washington residents. It's so critically important. And this, of course, is something that we, we believe the rest of the country is going to emulate. But it's got to start somewhere. And this, this state, this Washington state, as I mentioned at the get-go, they've never been kind of taken up the rear. They've always been a leader. Why not be a leader in this critically important uh, proposition for everybody that lives in this state? I am uh, here again to introduce to you former Representative Denny, Denny Delwell. I was fortunate to first meet Denny when I was just a kid, uh, not really a kid, but I was a young adult doing an internship in the state Senate. And he was a representative who happened to be the majority whip. And he happened to be chair or on the committee for the health healthcare committee. And he was on the rules committee, two key pivotal committees that was important because he was also um, part of the group of people who pushed and created the pilot project for our basic health plan. So with that, I'd like to introduce to you representative, former representative Denny Delwo of Spokane. Well, thank you very much, Cindy. We've gotten everybody here. It's good to see you all. And uh, it's a real honor to be introducing uh, Marcus Riccelli, the representative from the third district as Cindy and I were talking about before, um, I'm from the same district originally and was honored to represent the third district and also honored to be a majority whip and a member of the rules committee and the transportation committee, healthcare committee and chairman of the, of the uh, banking and insurance committee. And then much to my surprise, I was chosen to be uh, the head of the healthcare committee, house healthcare committee. So representative, Richelli, you're going to discover that they have put you in these positions with a plan. When the position opens up as chairperson of the healthcare committee, you will be appointed. They train you this way. And so uh, you do a wonderful job. Eileen Cody is too, but I think eventually she's going to want to get out of that position and you would do very well there. But uh, I wanted to introduce you as the person that has not only the training, working on campaigns, working with senators from the United States Congress, as well as uh, the majority leader, Lisa Brown, Senator Lisa Brown in the uh, Washington State Senate, but also someone who has worked personally in the community, providing food, help to the people during the COVID, COVID during the virus, and has just played a very important part helping people that desperately need that. You are the kind of person, the person that we would love to see, not only representing us in the third district, but also on the health care committee advocating uh, the universal health care bill that it takes someone with a lot of knowledge, a lot of strength to be able to get through. And so with that, I'd like to welcome you. Uh, you are now muted and hopefully you'll be unmuted and and be able to give us an introduction to what you promise us in the House of Representatives this coming year. Well, thank you, uh, Denny. And uh, looks like uh, I'm slated for a, a lot of good things if I start looking at the similarities in our career, majority whip, <laughs> healthcare committee rules, transportation. Uh, anyway, um, thank you for that kind introduction. Um, I'm excited to chat with you all. I'm excited to to, to be here just to thank you for all the work you have done and you continue to do um, to make sure that we're providing access to quality, affordable healthcare to every Washingtonian. And I really think we can be a catalyst for the rest of the country, but that largely falls uh, in gratitude to so many who are passionate about this issue and do the work day in and day out, session after session to keep moving this forward. Um, uh, I, I'd love to chat with you about um, a number of things, uh, but I know you're kind of interested in the outlook of session. Um, one, it'll be a different kind of session. Um, I think one of the real strong points for, for this movement is the uh, grassroots connectivity to legislators and uh, policymakers uh, as constituents and as advocates. And I think that will be different this year. The House 
at this point is moving to a largely remote session. That's good for me um, from a public health standpoint. Uh, and uh, I also think it could open up some new opportunities with remote testimony. A lot of folks from Eastern Washington, as they try and uh, uh, get involved, you know, have to give up a, a day or two of work. Sometimes that pass is closed down. So I'm really excited about the opportunity for more folks to be involved uh, uh, through remote testimony, but it will cause challenges in how we do our work. Um, hopefully we're adapting these types of uh, uh, opportunities to link via technology are important, but it's also creating a, a gap. And that's something that I'd like to chat about a little bit um, later, some of the priorities I'm working, including uh, closing the digital equity gap, because I think it's absolutely essential for healthcare and education and job creation. But as we, um, you know, my personal views of the importance of, fund, pu of uh, publicly funded universal healthcare um, are, are pretty straight up. Uh, I've been an advocate I didn't have much of a healthcare background before I came to the legislature. Um, since then, I knew that, that I've, I've been on the healthcare committee uh, for eight years now. Um, I have worked with the community in Spokane, particularly. We've banked a lot of our future on the healthcare uh, sector, um, but particularly I represent one of the poorest communities in the state and healthcare access is, is essential. Since then, um, you know, I've spent the last four and a half years working for one of our community health clinics as a project manager, um, and I've moved to a different role there too. Um, for those of you on the west side, similar to like an ICHS or a CMAR, where we see um, a largely Medicaid population. And um, uh, I just think it's absolutely essential that we continue to move the ball forward. Um, I think we need to deliver on a big change, but we're facing budget cuts and potential budget uh, woes. And so really looking at how we can um, move to something that is more economic, makes more economical sense, particularly in a COVID pandemic. While with the announcements even today, it's likely more people will be uh, potentially struggling with um, jobs, et cetera. And we need to make sure that they have not just um, uh, employment, but access to healthcare um, and so they can be healthy. Uh, I, I would say I do not support any kind of cuts budget. I think we not only should we not be going backwards, this is absolutely the time that we should be going forward. We need to be looking at uh, revenue, progressive revenue opportunities. Um, I'm a house majority whip, um, you know, and I know you all understand what it means to try and get to 50 and 25 uh, in both the house and the Senate. Um, I'm so pleased at the work that's been going on with the uh, universal healthcare work group uh, and I think that that will really help advise us and put us on a path forward, but we need that continued effort. We have a lot of new members in the house. I'm anxious for you all uh, to be communicating with them. I'm anxious for them. And by the way, I should say this is, <laughs> this is a, a very talented class that's coming in. I mean, we have been just so lucky the last uh, few uh, election cycles to just get um, more perspectives, more energy. And so I'm really excited about that. Um, but it will take education and the work that you'll do, not only that you did in the campaign side, um, but now uh, working uh, with them as elected officials as the policy pieces come forward. You know, I don't, I, I would really like to answer some questions. I think that's one of the opportunities um, these types of uh, engagements have just to really, um, I, shoot, I shoot from the hip. Uh, I'd love to just answer your questions, but I will say I would ask for your help too when it comes to cuts, um, particularly uh, when we talk about healthcare too much. Um, you know, we don't talk about oral healthcare. That's been a passion of mine and something that I've been working on. And right now, uh, one of the budget proposed budget cuts is to cut the adult dental Medicaid benefit. That would cut over a million people in Washington um, from getting that benefit. We know that without um, essential oral health care that people will have experienced more things like premature birth, heart disease and stroke, diabetes. I came to the oral health issue because of an amazing grassroots activist who um, actually talked about his bouts in and out of the emergency room. Uh, unfortunately, that person's not with us today. He died at 37 because um, largely from complications from oral health issues. Um, and nobody in Washingtonian should face that. Nobody uh, in this state, in this country should face that. And so that's one thing that I'm really laser focused on. Denny mentioned my work uh, with some of my colleagues on food security. 
If you can follow along, anytime we talk about food security, hashtag food is health to make sure that that's being embraced as a healthcare issue. And then finally, again, broadband. We have the chance, we've seen there's huge inequities in how we have broadband. And I serve on our state's telehealth collaborative. While it's not perfect, when we talk about behavior health, when we talk about um, ways that people connect, can connect and get access during COVID times. Uh, when we talk about reducing transportation barriers, telehealth is one of the parts of the solution, but we know that we're, we're, not, uh, we're not where we need to be from, uh, for education or healthcare from a digital equity standpoint. So I hope that that was a little bit of what you were interested in hearing, but I think likely um, if we can have some exchange here, we might, uh, we might be able to get more on uh, point with some of the things you're interested in talk talking about. Thank you for the so, opportunity. Absolutely. So thank you, Representative Richelli. One of the questions we had earlier that I had folks wait uh, until you were here, and this was about if you can expand a little bit on hopefully your bill um, 2910 uh, will be reintroduced. And of course, 2910 was a health care premium assistance bill. Um, and if you can talk a bit, little bit about that, and because that would really, that was a bill we really want to get on top of and push hard on that one. Yeah, thank you so much for bringing that up. I do think we need to look at um, a way we can raise revenue. It's a bill that has passed in other states. Um, I think that looking at this, also looking at Representative or Senator Robinson's bill on tax mm -hmm. on lives covered, these are options to, to raise revenue. And for me, the likely place where I would push for those dollars to go is to directly connect them to things like public health, but also uh, a state subsidy um, to make healthcare more fit, affordable on our exchange. Um, we know that that group right above Medicaid from 138% of the federal poverty level to 200% particularly, you know, they have deductibles that are very large. Um, it's not what I would call healthcare. You all know that as well, because this is what you're fighting for every day. Um, but if you have to pay a deductible of 7000 or $7,500, that's not healthcare, okay? And so that's just, for me, that's just... Um, one of the ways that I think we can do it. Also, you know, it turns out insurance companies haven't been doing that bad. Yeah. You know? Yeah, that was definitely gets to one of, yeah, that definitely gets to June Robinson's bill. Um, I believe, uh, I think it was Robinson, but we also had a bill in the Senate that was um, uh, a fee, a fee on excess profits by the insurance companies that are nonprofits. It yeah, it's on the their res yeah, it was on their reserves. So it's not their yeah. reserves, it's their excess reserves. Which, right. So the problem with that and why I introduced the um, tax, bill. my bill um, particularly, was because I did talk with some of the insurance companies, including the nonprofits who said, look, you know who gets hit? We only get hit. It's not distributed and shared amongst some of those uh, much bigger insurance companies that are multi-state, the, the bigger companies. So I said, hey, this is something that will hit everybody equally. If you stand back, it would, in my opinion, be a more fair way to go after it. And so that's really um, was kind of the genesis of the bill. Um, and uh, what, you know, and I'm going to continue stakeholdering that. And I don't think I'll get to a point where um, these entities necessarily support something. But through conversations, um, you know, it might be the one that they uh, hate the hate the least. Um, and why is that important? Well, maybe it's not to get to our votes, but maybe if they're if they um, are willing to work with us a little bit and understand the purpose of revenue, we have a, a better path um, towards success. I can't tell you how it's gonna end up. I just think the conversation is essential and we're in a time when we absolutely need to be looking at how we can generate revenue to make healthcare more affordable. That's really great to hear. And that's, we're just gung ho to get behind you on, on getting your bill redone. Um, so one of the other questions we have is what gives you hope uh, in the time with the $4.4 .4 billion budget deficit, what gives you hope? Um, in with that and with especially in the time of pandemic? Well, not to get too political, but Democratic majorities in the House and Senate give me hope because I don't and I think it's not just the quantity of members that matters. It's the quality. And I mm -hmm. strongly feel that um, the House Democrat caucus and our de and our Democrat colleagues in the Senate uh, will not stand for uh, a cuts budget. And um, that gives me hope. Mm -hmm. uh, there's this idea that we can go backwards somehow in the time of most need has, does, uh, doesn't make sense. And I saw it as a staffer during the last recession. I worked for Senator uh, Lisa Brown when she was majority leader. And I saw the cuts that we were making, yeah. um, TANF to um, 
again, adult, we cut completely cut adult dental Medicaid benefit. You know, for those of you in Spokane, like Denny, we cut programs like Sally's house that took care of our endangered children. Um, we just did so many things that just made people worse off. And I actually think for those who were around during that time, they very much still feel the pain of those decisions. So we have this great mix of progressive legislators and newer legislators that uh, will not stand for that. And you actually have um, progressive legislators that went through the last recession who still feel those battle scars and that pain. And we do not yeah. want to go backwards. That's great. So one of the things uh, that we talked about earlier um, was uh, about the University of Healthcare Work Group. And some mm -hmm. of the great parts is there was an actuarial study done as a part of that work group. And the important part of that actuarial study is when it comes to we, the, the actual studies showed without a doubt that fully covering every person in the state of Washington uh, with universal health care would actually result in a savings of $2.7 billion um, in the first year. And that's, a, that's not all government spending, but that's total spending that's on health care. So, and then certainly, as I mentioned earlier, it goes up to $5.6 billion in subsequent years. So those are things that we're hoping that the legislature can really see as, as a bright spot. Would that, do you, you know, how do you think that's going to appeal? Because there's, there's four legislators on the work group and they certainly are, uh, seem very scared of, of making that kind of a big ask of moving forward. Yeah. One of the things, it's hard to look in the crystal ball. There's so many changing parts right now. For instance, again, I think we're going to be operating in an environment that is um, different than we ever had, but I think that actually lends it to a, a lot of advantages as far as um, we have to be problem solvers. Um, I think we can't leave uh, with a cuts budget. And I think real solutions have to be on the table, but this is kind of that uh, figuring ways to have those conversations with legislators in this environment, whether it be, uh, you know, Zoom meetings, et cetera, and uh, putting something in front of them and really asking them, can we count on your support? That's what I do as, as WIP. And, um, you know, I think we need to go through that. And it's a one, it's a legislator and, and different legislators will have different issues, rationale for what they do support. Um, I do think as that's going on, I'm going to continue also though, I don't think it, my interest in seeing this policy move forward and my passion for it um, uh, does not discount continuing to work on things like providing subsidies on the exchange and all these other things. And so that is important to me as well. And I think to a lot of legislators to make sure that we're, we're, we're doing things right now that can make uh, healthcare more accessible and affordable, but we can do hard things. I think, you know, with the Biden presidency, we never know. And with redistricting coming up, we don't know what things look like two years from now. And so I think there's a real um, obligation to try and, uh, to, to really work on hard, difficult things. I think it is lim limited um, uh, this session because things will be very much scoped down, but I definitely think thing there is more room to entertain things in the healthcare realm because of COVID, because of the budget hole, and because um, you know our, so many people are committed to seeing us do a much better job, a, a better, more efficient system, uh, a system that can help more people uh, too many people are not, are being cut out right now. We know that's clear. Exactly. Well, we're so grateful to have your help. Again, we were honored. Uh, we were so thrilled to be able to honor you as a healthcare champion. We look forward to working with you closely in the legislature. And uh, uh, here we go. So thanks again for being with us today. Thank you, Cindy. If I can just make one last pitch again, I know we're working on this, all, all this together. I also would ask for your support to save the adult dental Medicaid benefit, to not let our COFA communities be cut off from healthcare and dental, and um, to uh, make sure that we're working on equity for healthcare and education uh, broadband in our digital equity efforts. And I think Pat's dog is all for that, so let's do it. Yep. All right, great. Well, thank you very much. Thank you so much again. Uh, we're all grateful to have your support and uh, we'll continue moving forward on progress. So now it is time to introduce our board members. I would like all of the board members to turn on their video and their mic so we can wave at each other and at anyone who is our attendees that are still here. 
Okay, we need to change our views, don't we, to a gallery view probably to see everybody. Yay, hello, hello. Hello, healthcare for all. Yay, Chris. All right, <laughs> thank you everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. All right.